Hey, welcome back, everybody. Um, hey, big news. Uh, our doors will be opening this coming Sunday. Um, it's a long time coming, and we're very excited for it. Uh, still a few things that we still got to figure out, but we we're just so blessed and fortunate that we we're able to meet together again, again, this coming Sunday. Uh, some little changes that you need to be aware of, and I know some of you have probably read our announcements through email and possibly our, our website, but we will continue to have Bible studies, and, and if you're part of that, you already know this already, but you'll be moving to 9 a.m. to 10 a.m. Uh, once that's done, it should give you ample time to get here for in-person service at 1045. Uh, there will be some slight changes there that you'll hear about when we uh, start our service, but we hope you can join us. And if you can't join us, again, that's okay. Uh, we understand. Um, continue to be part of our online community, and we will continue to record these messages up until the time we have figured out how to do our live stream services. Uh, that requires a little bit more involvement, so please uh, give us a little patience and we, again, figure that out. Um, also, too, um, very special birthday coming up, too, uh, at the same day as our reopening, and that's my son Caden's birthday. He'll be turning 14. I can't believe it. I feel older just saying that, but I'm so excited for him and just how he's been growing up and just how incredible young man he's turned out to be, and I praise God for him every, every day. So with that being said, I hope you are doing well, too, and uh, that you're able to uh, continue to join us online and just continue to do with all the things that um, are going on in your lives. We're still in this whole COVID thing, too, but uh, lots of stuff happening in the world. With that being said, why don't you join me at the Word of Prayer? Father God, we thank you so much for uh, today. Um, thank you for this opportunity to worship you, Lord. And, and with this being a recorded message, Father, some people will be watching this on Sunday morning, but at the same time, we will be having an in-person worship as well. And we do pray for that time together, Lord. It's been a good, gosh, seven months, six, seven months, Lord, since we've last done this in person. And honestly, Lord, you know my heart too. I'm not quite sure I remember what, what to do anymore. Um, all joking aside, Father, it's more of a excitement, Lord, that we can come together and just to see how you move each and every one of us, Lord, in our worship and our message, and most of all, Lord, in our worship of you. We do pray for the people that will be returning. Um, I know there might be some intrepidation, Lord, some questions, Father, maybe a little bit of fear because of the whole COVID thing. But Lord, let us be rest assured, Father, that your great and mighty hands upon each and every one of us. And Father, for those that aren't ready to return, I just pray that you continue to bless them, Father, and, and um, you speak to their hearts as when um, they are to return and join us in worship of you collectively together here in this church. So Father, we do pray for everyone out there too, Lord, and we know there are different struggles of every kind. And we do pray, Lord, that you continue to bless their lives and guide them, Lord God. And lastly too, Lord, I thank you so much for Caden uh, and celebrating his 14th birthday. Uh, Lord, what a blessing he's been to our family and to those around him. Continue to bless him, Father, and help him know more and more about you, Lord, and teach us as parents to, to teach him more and more about you and Jesus as well. So again, Lord, we thank you so much for we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Again, everyone, thank you for joining us. And if you haven't been joining us for our online messages, we are in the third week of our walk through uh, the letter of Second Peter. And our theme is entitled... Be on guard, be on guard. As the Apostle Peter's message, message excuse me, to these scattered churches in Asia Minor was to be on guard for the false teachers and the false prophets that had crept into the churches well, that, of that time. And even today, everyone, false prophets and false teachers are still up well, to their old tricks. And I believe that the devil is using false teachers, everyone, in order to cast doubt will in the hearts of Christians in order for us to fall in our faith and pull us away from Christ. That's always been the ploy of every false teacher and false prophet, and I think that still exists today. And this is why the Apostle Peter stressed instruction on growing in the knowledge of God. That was in chapter 1, everyone, that we are to be growing in the knowledge of God as a means to be able to defend ourselves from such false teachers and false prophets. And if we know our Bibles, then we are better, better able to discern any false teachings that is told to us. That makes a lot of sense, right? The more we know, right? The more we know. And in addition, Peter also displays his credibility as your true teacher from Christ. And this was validated, everyone, by his consistency and his commitment to teaching the truth. We saw that 
in last week's message. And his time with Jesus also confirmed by his eyewitness testimony and other eyewitness testimonies that he was, he was, he was there. He was with Christ, and he could be trustworthy. And lastly, too, his teaching of Christ was also validated by the reliability of the prophecy foretold by the Old Testament prophets. Peter also stresses what prophecy is and well, what is not. And as we begin this next section, let's go back and, and read how we ended our last sermon in chapter 1, verses 19 through 21. And it says this, We also have the prophetic message as something completely reliable, and you will do well to pay attention to it as to a light shining in a dark place until the day dawns and the morning star rises in your hearts. Above all, you must understand that no prophecy of Scripture came about by the prophet's own interpretation of things. For prophecy never had its origin in the human will, but prophets, though human, spoke from God as they were carried along by the Holy Spirit. It was very important that Peter emphasized that prophecy of Scripture was never, or excuse me, never came about by the prophet's own interpretation. But, but, the, but by the guiding of the Holy Spirit. So again, it was never man-made. It was always Holy Spirit-driven. In other words, prophecy, again, is never just some human-made prediction. It's never a human-made prediction. So this led to Peter's, um, Peter to educate these churches about the reality of false prophets. So we're only going to look at the first three verses of 2 Peter, as chapter 2, as we start this new chapter, where Peter provides what I call an introduction to false prophets, or we can call false prophets 101. And if, if you went to college, you understand what I'm talking about. So it was 101 classes that are the introductory courses. Well, these first three verses are going to kind of be like that too, what and how Peter describes what false prophets are, and as well as false teachers. So let's take a look at that today in 2 Peter chapter 2, verses 1 through 3. And with our simple truth for today, that false prophets and false teachers are sneaky, persuasive, and they're greedy. I'm just breaking it down as simple as possible as I've read these first three verses. That false prophets and false teachers are sneaky, persuasive, and they're greedy. So let's take a look at verses 1 through 3 in, the, in its entirety. And it says this, but there were, were also false prophets among the people, just as there will be false teachers among you. They will secretly introduce destructive heresies, even denying the sovereign Lord who bought them, bringing swift destruction on themselves. Many will follow their depraved conduct and will bring the way of truth into disrepute. And verse 3, in their greed, these teachers will exploit you with fabricated stories. Their condemnation has long been hanging over them, and their destruction has not been sleeping. It seems that there were, again, there were both false prophets, those that claimed to have divine revelations from God, and also were false teachers, those that perverted the teachings of God. But both seem to be described in the same way. And that's what I want to share with you again today, again, going back to our simple truth. Those three things that false prophets are and how I feel Peter describes them. Well, the first one again is this, that false prophets are sneaky. False prophets are sneaky, and that goes back to verse 1. So people who do sneaky things are able to cheat and lie, but do it secretly. Did you hear that? People who do sneaky things are able to cheat and lie, but they do it secretly. And I want you to think of a time when you did something sneaky. Just think about it. You probably have to go back to your childhood or maybe just the other week. I don't know. But think of a time that you did something sneaky. And I bet many of you can confess of doing sneaky things in order to gain access to something or to get something, right? That's why we do it. I'll give you one personal example. Uh, my example is when I was a teenager, and this was uh, before I could drive, okay? I, I, you know, I was a teenager. I was probably, I don't know, between 11 and 15 years old. And my friends and I would often be dropped off at the mall to hang out, okay? That's what we did back then. We didn't have very much, especially where I grew up. We tended to go to the mall, we took, or, and, or we took the bus to the mall sometimes. But a lot of times what we could do, because we didn't have a lot of money, 
we would just have enough maybe to go see a movie, all right? Or maybe get a bucket of popcorn to share or get a, get a Coke or something like that. But we would do those kind of things. So we would go see a movie, but after the movie, that in which we had paid for was done, well, we did this, and don't think less of me, it was a long time ago, right? That we would sneak into other theaters to see a different movie. Well, basically without paying, right? We would sneak into a different movie because there was nothing else to do. We already paid our entry fee to get in the building. Why not watch some other movies well, on, on, on the manager's uh, expense? So this is what we would do. We would oftentimes just kind of hang out in the arcade, right? Even though we had no money to play, we would pretend to play, just kind of loiter a little bit. That's what a lot of young people did. Or we would go to the bathroom, and we'd hang out in there for a while until we knew which movie was starting. And when a movie started and they opened the doors and groups of people would start going in, we would basically kind of hide behind large groups of people or maybe families that we saw. And why? We did this so the managers wouldn't notice us going into this movie again that we hadn't paid for. So basically, we were sneaking in, right? The secret again, everyone, I hope I'm not teaching your children these, and you young people, please don't follow this model. Um, we did this. <laughs> so we can blend in and not be noticed, right? I mean, I think you've probably figured that out already. We were sneaking in to see these movies behind other people, large groups of people. Why? Again, so we would not be noticed, so we can blend in. This, everyone, is exactly what pro false prophets and false teachers do. They sneak into churches, blending in, so no one will notice. They will look like anyone else in the church and behave and speak in such a way well, they virtually might go unnoticed. They may even claim salvation in Jesus as a means to bring in their heretical practices. Yet as sneaky as these false prophets and false teachers might be, it is, however, possible to identify them. Did you hear that? Okay, it is possible to identify them. And how do we know that? Well, Jesus teaches this himself. Let's look at Matthew chapter 7, verses 15 through 20. And it says this, Watch out for false prophets, Jesus says. They come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly they are ferocious wolves. By their fruit you will recognize them. Do people pick grapes from thorn bushes or figs from thistles? Likewise, every good tree bears good fruit, but a bad tree bears well bad fruit. A good tree cannot bear bad fruit, and a bad tree cannot bear good fruit. Every tree that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. Thus, by their fruit you will recognize them. In Matthew chapter 7, verses 15 through 20. Jesus, everyone, provide, provides or provided a warning of just how sneaky false, false prophets are. And they are considered, again, as in a very popular phrase, wolves in sheep's clothing. They're looking like us, but in reality are wolves that want to ravage us. They will look like anyone in the church, but fortunately they can be recognized by the fruit that they will bear. They can be recognized by the fruit that they will bear. For many people at that time, agriculture and farming was something, well, they pretty much all understood. And the only way you knew which trees are good are the ones that needed to be are the, and the ones that need to be cut down were determined by the quality of fruit well, that they produce. That's the only way that you would know. Is it a good tree or is it a bad tree that we have to take, to take down? And such, again, is also true for false prophets. Initially, they look like any other, well, quote-unquote, tree. They look like any tree in the church. But eventually, their evil intent will be made known by the fruit that they bear. So this is why it is so important, everyone, to be on guard. For that bad fruit might be consumed and poison others in the church. I mean, look again what Peter says here in verse 2 of chapter 2. He says this, Many will fall over the depraved conduct and will bring the way of truth into disrepute. See, some of the church will fall prey to these wolves in sheep's clothing. They will be convinced of the false teaching that was snuck into the church. And this is what false prophets and false teachers have in common as well. 
and it's this, everyone, they can be very, very persuasive. So that's our second description as we look at False Prophets 101, that false prophets are persuasive. False prophets are persuasive. When my wife and I were newly married and moved into our very first home, we received a knock on the door, and it was a salesman, a salesman selling, of all things, vacuums. Now, I won't tell you the brand, but it was a very nice vacuum. Now, this was back in the day when door-to-door -door salesmen still existed. I don't even think they exist anymore. And he was a very nice, and he was a very charming man. And the next thing you know, he's in our home demonstrating how inferior our vacuum was compared to his incredible vacuum. And he gave us all of these convincing specifications and data about why his vacuum was so much better and how compared to, well, our cheap little vacuum. So the most convincing thing he did was this, everyone. He, he said, can I have some salt? So we gave him one of those big canisters of salt. And he proceeded to pour it on the carpet. And we kind of stood there going, what? You know, what are you doing? He goes, well, I want to prove to you that how good our vacuum is compared to yours. So he tells us after you pour some salt onto our carpet, he goes, take your vacuum, and I want you to vacuum over it several times. So we do. And he asks us this, everyone. He says, do you think your vacuum sucked up all the salt? Well, I went over it a few times, you know, probably more than 10 times, actually. And I was convinced, yeah, I probably picked up a lot of it. And of course he says, well, are you sure? So of course he brings out his vacuum and it had a special collection dish. So that way you can see what was being sucked up would be put in that collection dish. So he just goes over it a few times and lo and behold, a lot more salt will got sucked up. And we were in awe. Wow, this vacuum is just amazing. It was clear that our vacuum was so much more inferior to his and we just had to have it. We were so convinced, we spent a whopping, and get this, man, this is almost over, so over 25 years ago, newly married, we spent $1,000 on a vacuum. Can you believe that? We spent $1,000 on a vacuum. Next to our house and cars, that was the single biggest purchase we've ever made together as, a husband, as husband and wife. Now, I'll be honest, this vacuum did last us for a while, and it did its job. But here's the thing. I was always left wondering if there was still salt on the carpet after he had vacuumed over it. In other words, we were so convinced that the vacuum picked all of it up. I'm curious if I had passed over the spot one more time with my old vacuum, if salt would still come back up. You see, I think maybe we might have been duped a little bit. But I think that old vacuum would have done its job too, and it was only $100. Did we get cheated? Did we get fooled? Did we get duped? Perhaps. But the point of the story was how persuasive what the salesperson was. In many ways, everyone, false prophets and false teachers are the greatest sales people. That's what they're trying to accomplish. They're trying to persuade you into believing in what they have to sell. And if they are able to make a sale, then they are able to make a what? Well, a profit. They're able to make a profit. And this is how the Apostle Peter describes false prophets and false teachers as those that profit from others. Let's look at verse 3. Verse 3 says this, In their greed, these teachers will exploit you with fabricated stories. Their condemnation has long been hanging over them, and their destruction has not been sleeping. In the end, false teachers will be judged for their evils, or the evils that they do. But Peter gives a clear understanding as to what motivates false prophets and false teachers. And that motivation, everyone, is a simple thing called greed. False prophets are motivated by greed. False prophets are motivated by greed. For example, false prophets will claim they have received a vision or message from God that you will be rich and your health will be restored. 
That's pretty persuasive, everyone. If you are convinced that God has spoken through that prophet, and God has told that prophet he wants me to be rich, and he wants me to be free of disease. That's very persuasive. And false teachers will teach the same thing by taking biblical passages out of context and offering a theology that seems just way too good well to pass up. There is one type, everyone, of false teaching that I'm, I feel that we must guard against because it's happening today and it's growing. It's a teaching called the prosperity gospel. The prosperity gospel. And what the prosperity gospel teaches is that God rewards faith with financial gain and restored health. That's their claim. Oftentimes it's called the health and wealth gospel. And the prosperity gospel is one of the fastest growing church movements in the entire world. And many of these teachers are well-known, what we call tele-evangelists, that you can just watch every day. Matter of fact, you can probably turn me up and find one on TV right now that will be preaching this thing called prosperity gospel. And they are extremely popular with people who are experiencing financial hardship and dealing with health-related challenges. They are also widely popular in developing countries all well around the world. This prosperity gospel basically, to me, in my opinion, exploits the poor. It exploits the poor, exploits the needy, and those who are in desperate health situations by promising blessings, well, if they have enough faith. And also, everyone, and here's the kicker, if you are able to give money as evidence of your faith. See, that's something that some people just don't pick up on. That how much you give is evidence of your faith. In addition, these teachers will sell things like holy water, and, and, a ta and towels that have been blessed by these, these, these evangelists. And they are told to have healing properties to them. Now, they will only say well, it's a donation of a dollar, but let me tell you this. Two million of these things, of these items, were ordered and mailed out. Everyone, if you know your math, someone made two million dollars. This is big business, everyone, and the disguise of biblical teaching. I'll say that one more time. This is big business disguised as biblical teaching. Now this might sound judgmental, but I feel it's more of an obvious observation, everyone. Have you noticed, if you've seen any of these televangelists before, that they're all multimillionaires? They're all multimillionaires that own mansions, luxury cars, and some, everyone, even own private jets. You can't just be a, you know, a, just a millionaire and own a private jet. You have to be a multimillionaire to do that. They live very lavish lifestyles for, as pastors and evangelists. They dress in the fanciest of clothes and eat the, the best of foods. My question, everyone, is this. How? How? Now, they would say that God has blessed them for their faithfulness, right? That's the whole point of the prosperity gospel. But, you know, I would think otherwise. I believe, everyone, it's from greed and from the exploitation of those that they target. Let me share with you a part of an article of a family member of one of the most famous televangelists that I won't mention by name. But this is what he says in an excerpt that he uh, wrote for... Uh, a very reliable Christian uh, news source called Christianity Today. He writes this. Growing up in the family empire, and he says empire, was like belonging to some hybrid of the royal family and the mafia. Our lifestyle was lavish, our loyalty was enforced, and our version of the gospel, well, it was big business. Though Jesus Christ was still a part of our gospel, he was more of a magic genie than the king of kings. Rubbing him the right way by giving money and having enough faith would unlock your spiritual inheritance. God's goal was not his glory, but our gain. His grace was not to set us free from sin, but to make us rich. The abundant life he offered wasn't eternal. It was it was now in the present. 
we live the prosperity gospel. This is what he wrote. See, this family member's eyes were open to the false teachings of the prosperity gospel and has since confessed his true faith in Christ and in seeking the truth, the true truth of Scripture. So, everyone, we can see that false prophets and false teachers, well, they've been playing the same game from the very beginning, everyone. Nothing has really changed except for how their false messages are being spread. If it's by physically coming into our churches, through having seminars or what they call crusades, from television programs that you can watch from morning till night, or on the internet and social media, everyone, we must be on guard for these false prophets and false teachers because why? They are sneaky. They are persuasive, and they are greedy. Let's pray. Father God, um, thank you for the words of Peter. Lord, um, he tells us straight out to be on guard and describes just in these first few verses alone, this is what makes a false prophet and a false teacher. These are, are things, Lord, that motivate them and, and also how they are able to get into churches unnoticed because they're sneaky, Lord God. They're sneaky. They want to go in unnoticed, totally unnoticed by everybody in order to teach, Lord, their, their heretical um, beliefs. And Lord God, too, they're persuasive, Lord. They're able to convince people, Lord, other sheep in the church of what they're saying is correct even though it's an aberration, Lord, of, of the, tr the truth of the gospel and of your teachings. Father, they're persuasive and they're there to sell something, Lord, that it just isn't right. But they're motivated again by their greed. They're looking to exploit those, Lord, in order to gain something from it, if it's money or if it's just power. Father God, continue to teach us what it means to be on guard. But these things are out there right now, Lord, as we speak. And we do pray for those too, Lord, that maybe have fallen prey to this. And Lord, that they can turn around and find the truth of who you are and be free of this thing called the prosperity gospel. Thank you, Lord, for this time together, Lord. And again, be with us, Lord, as we open our doors this coming Sunday. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Look to see some of you soon. Take care and God bless.